that we can see the slides a bit better because I think this we turned on this one so that you can see me, but then that's much better, isn't it? Um, okay. So, well, thank you so much, uh, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me and to all of you for being here. Um, as Mehdad said, uh, the, my presentation is entitled Gender Islamophobia and Identity Puzzles, New Muslim Women in Spain. So that is my email, ig12 at soas.ac.uk. You can email me for any requests, any inquiries. We can discuss uh, whatever <laughs> you want. And um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, research that I did for my master's in gender and feminist studies in uh, 2012. The MA <coughs> dissertation was entitled Feminism and Piety, a Gender Analysis of Women Converts to Islam. So um, this dissertation was the result of my own concerns and my positionality. I had, uh, before doing my MA, I had been living in Egypt for three years where I devoted to learning Arabic, which I had started uh, studying uh, during my undergrads uh, in translation and interpreting. Uh, so I, when I went back to Spain from Egypt, um, I was disturbed by um, mainly the, some Islamophobic discourses that I could see in hegemonic feminism, especially Western European Spanish uh, feminism. And so I became interested in uh, a group of, uh, of Muslims, uh, that is Muslims who um, were not born into Islam, but who decided to embrace it afterwards. Um, and I did, uh, I conducted uh, interviews, live story interviews with five different women who embraced Islam at different points in their lives. I will talk about them and we will uh, listen to their voices. Um, and I also attended the meetings for new Muslims or converts um, in a mosque in Bilbao in the Basque country in the north of Spain. Um, I was interested in, in knowing why and, and how had Islam become meaningful for them and um, what their Islamic and also gender discourse were, was and how these were interlinked and um, also to see how the Ummah but also the non-Muslim um, entourage had welcomed or not welcomed <coughs> their becoming Muslim. So um, actually I had drawn an arrow, uh, okay, so I'm there and you cannot see, there was, um, anyways, there was an illustration, <laughs> all right. So this was an illustration that actually um, shows what I was saying about my, the concerns that informed my research. I mean, you cannot see it and anyways, it's in Spanish, but it's a, a Muslim um, woman saying, well, on the one hand, we have patriarchy, on the other, we have Islamophobia. What are we Muslim women supposed to do? And the other woman tells her, um, we need to go ahead and we need to do it together. There's no other way. And then there is actually a group <coughs> of women who are following them and are shouting at them and saying, wait, we are coming with you. Um, so, uh, tonight uh, I will now briefly introduce and contextualize the phenomenon of uh, conversion, uh, religious conversions, and then I will talk about the conversion narratives, and I put conversion into inverted commas because a lot of new Muslims don't like the word conversion. Uh, but for non-Muslim uh, audiences, it's easier to understand what we're talking about um, when we mention conversion 
it's clear that it's people who were not born into Islam but actually embraced it later. And what I will do is um, we will, I will summarize some of my conclusions but then I will read some of the testimonies of, of these women which I think is the most important thing to, to listen to their voices. Um, then we will see how their conversion into Islam was seen from both the Islamic community and the non-Muslim community. Um, I will then show how some of these women um, became Islamic feminists and how for them um, it was, uh, their position was um, facing patriarchal Islam on the one hand and Islamophobic feminism on the other. And then by the end of the talk I will talk about how uh, one of these women adopted piety um, as a form, and I will explain and break down these terms better when I get there, but piety as an, as an alternative to secular heteronormative uh, inequality. But let's start. Uh, of course, throughout history and in different regions in the world, um, there have been many types of religious conversions, and <coughs> we need to uh, locate historically and also geographically very well uh, every time we refer to uh, conversions. Um, it, it doesn't really show there, but the cover of the book uh, is, um, is the book by Egyptian author Radwa Ashur, and I would like to take the opportunity to uh, recommend it. If you haven't read it, it's about a family. It's, a, it's actually three generations. It's a, it's a trilogy, and it's uh, a novel about three generations of a family in Granada, in Spain, uh, in Al-Andalus, in Al but then the fall of Al-Andalus and how the members of this family decide to convert to Christianity precisely um, not to be expelled from uh, Iberia. So this is another time uh, different issues and motivations to uh, convert, but I thought I would recommend it. Then, um, with regard to more contemporary um, conversions, uh, scholarly literature or academics, especially the secular academics, have tended to um, approach conversion from a very constructivist framework thus disregarding spirituality and the importance of spirituality for conversion. And, um, well, I think this is very problematic. And uh, the other two covers um, somehow do, do acknowledge the importance of spirituality <coughs> in people's lives and in people's decisions to embrace uh, specifically Islam. This is uh, an old book, uh, it's called New Muslims in Britain, and it's, I think, from seven, 1979. It's one of the first studies uh, on the uh, New Muslims in, in Britain. And this other one is an edited volume um, that deals with Western women who have embraced Islam. Um, more recently, uh, several reports uh, attest that after 9-11 there has been an increase in uh, conversions to Islam, especially amongst women. And this might seem um, puzzling given that after 9-11, as you very well know uh, better than, than I do, Islamophobia has uh, unfortunately arisen and um, specifically gendered Islamophobia as well. Gendered Islamophobia is a term uh, coined by uh, Jasmine Zine, and it refers to the specific ways in which Islamophobia uh, acts 
differently between women and men. The different forms uh, by which women and, and, and women, uh, sorry, Muslim men and women are um, criticized or seen, their bodies judged, etc., etc. So, um, what I would like to stress is that there is not one reason for people to decide to embrace Islam. Uh, normally, uh, Islamophobic discourses attribute just, you know, like these people are being brainwashed uh, to, that, or like they are um, coerced into and forced into Islam, as we will see in some of the, um, in some of the testimonies. Um, instead, what I have seen and what I hope to show you uh, through the testimonies today is that there are a lot of elements because Islam and the biographies of people are very rich. So the convergence of these two uh, very rich realms or packages, if we want, makes the fact that there are a lot of elements that attract people, and specifically women, into Islam. Um, so I want to stress the agency, the capacity to decide and to act upon these decisions that women uh, have in deciding to embrace Islam. There is one scholar uh, called Margot Badran who has stressed the fact that uh, new Muslim women exert agency when embracing Islam and I want to say yes of course and I want to show also how beyond the act of entering Islam in how they deal with the various situations that I will show you these women show that they have a lot of agency. So among the elements of this puzzle um, uh, are spiritual thirst, right? So um, either as a childhood intuition or as a curiosity that they have um, accumulated and explored throughout life, uh, spirituality is a very important element that attracts uh, women into Islam. There is also the warmth of the ummah, um, although we will see that depending on how these women understand Islam, the Ummah can also be not so warm. Um, for some of them, the, the, the ban of the consumption of alcohol and drugs is also an important element of attraction into Islam, as well as the fact that some have Muslim partners and so it is important for them to share the religion with their partners. Although I would like to very much stress the fact that none of these women that I interviewed are converts for love. And uh, a lot of Islamophobic uh, discourses and also very sexist uh, just consider these women, you know, converts for love. So they have a Muslim partner, so this is why they uh, embrace Islam. As we will see, this is in conjunction with, uh, with other elements, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I should say that um, the names are nicknames, but the women that I interviewed themselves chose the nicknames. Some of them had adopted names um, relevant to the Islamic tradition, and some hadn't, or some used them more than others, but they chose, some chose to, um, you know, maintain sort of a Spanish or, or, or Basque <coughs> name, and some others um, chose the, the, the Islamic uh, names, as you will see. So I was going to say I will read the first one, and then you can read the others, but I think you cannot see it, so you will have to hear my voice all the time. I will try to <laughs> be uh, entertaining. Okay, so what does Elena say? She says, I used to go out and do cocaine. Everything I felt curious about, I would try. And if Ahmed, who was her partner, had not been there that day, today, after St. Joan, St. Joan, uh, St. 
St. John's Eve, sorry, I would have been lying on the sofa all day long, hungover, after having done everything, everything. For me, entering Islam has been one of the best things ever. And then, for me, one of the major reasons was the answer to questions which upset me a lot. Why am I here? I mean, what's the purpose? If you don't think about it and you live your life and that's it, who cares? I'm here, it's me, because I was born and that's it. Yes, but why were you born? How did all of this come about? For me, it was just inconceivable that, is there really nothing more? What is going to happen with this degree of consciousness that I have, whereby I am here, I'm alive, I am? I had read a bit um, before embracing Islam. I know a bit about all religions, okay? So here we see that Elena sees in Islam a way to get out of the drugs on the first place. She also acknowledges the fact that Ahmed, her partner, has been another um, way for her to get to know Islam. But we also learn that she had long been having a lot of existential or you know, spiritual questions that she couldn't really find an answer for. And she had been delving into different religious traditions. And then uh, she uh, sort of uh, opted uh, for Islam. So there are different elements. Fadwa, for example, says, all that solidarity, feeling so welcome, the abandonment which society feels and the protection you feel within the Islamic community, that is what I craved. Mine became a refuge house of new and wayward people, as I call them. Whenever someone feels alone, they come here, they used to, and chat until late at night, drink tea, eat cakes and food. I am the daughter of an abusive father. That's why I left home as soon as I could. I don't want any woman to suffer abuse. I was an abused daughter, and my mother was also abused. Rauf, her partner, helped me a lot. My father was an alcoholic. And one thing I was sure of is that I would never marry someone who drank alcohol. Again, here we can see that there are structural elements, right? So she says, all the abandonment that society feels and then she finds in the Islamic community the warmth, right? That is actually what she craved. And it's also what she gives back because her home becomes a refuge home, right? Um, and then there is also in another part of the, um, of the interview, she, she speaks of her own biography, right? Her own life as the daughter of an abusive father who was also abusive to her mother and who was an alcoholic. And so the one thing she knew is that she would never marry someone who drank alcohol and actually her partner who helped her a lot with the trauma of the abuse doesn't drink alcohol. So if you see what I mean, there are all these elements that come together. Uh, and there is a lot of agency. But Nora, for example, says, some people in the mosque entourage did criticize me for being married to a non-Muslim man. However, now I am sure that I, that I became a Muslim for my own self, not for anyone. So here, for example, the experience that Nora has uh, is very different to the one that Fadwa had because Nora was married to a non-Muslim man and this was not accepted uh, within the mosque uh, community. Ihsan, for her part, says, my neighbors learned I became Muslim after I wore the hijab and I wore it a year after embracing Islam. When I wore it, it became a big issue. People whom I thought would criticize me a lot would love and tell me, don't listen to anyone, you look beautiful. The only thing that matters is that you're happy. But then there were those whom I expected to react well who criticized me on my back and I could feel it. And they would say, 
take that off, what are you doing wearing that? Or have you become amora, amor, which in the context of Spain has very, very negative connotations <coughs> due to the history of Reconquista. So people would say, does your husband oblige you, beat you? And I would want to answer, Ehsan says, you've known me for ages, me and my husband, and you know the type of relationship we have and that I am the one who wears the pants. How is he going to oblige me? The truth is there is a little bit of everything. So here we clearly see that the reaction that Ehsan um, received was varied, uh, but it had a very uh, violent element uh, of Islamophobia and racism <coughs> that was mainly uh, related to her wearing the hijab. This is what some um, scholars in the context of Islamophobia in Spain have um, termed the, the hijab as the late motive of uh, Islamophobia. Now there's uh, the testimony of Anna who says, I thought, I cannot say I'm not a believer, but I didn't call it a name. But at the same time, there were so many things I could not stand. I would say, I won't join this club, a club where women need to stay at home, polygamy. I had a spiritual feeling and curiosity, but then I knew I would not give up on this. No way, after all the struggles. I am the daughter and granddaughter of women who have fought, and thanks to that, I have been able to study, to vote. I have much to thank feminism for. So I would search, who says it? Where does it appear? When is it said? And I would reach the conclusion that throughout the centuries, the interpretation of the text, and she means the Quran, has overlapped the text. You can no longer read the text with the eyes of the 21st century. The medieval reading has been imposed. So this is why I have termed this slide the path to Islamic feminism, because in, this, um, in Anna's testimony, we can see that she also departs from a spiritual um, curiosity. Uh, she does recognize herself as a believer, but then she sees certain things that she doesn't accept. Her own feminist consciousness and identity is in conflict with uh, the, some of the discourses. And so she starts searching and she says the conclusion that she reaches is um, the interpretation of the Quran, the tafsir has uh, sort of been uh, overlapped. Over the, over the text, over the Quran. So to continue with Anna, uh, she is um, and was, when I interviewed her in 2012, uh, an Islamic feminist activist, and she was uh, one of the organizers of the several Islamic feminist uh, conferences that took place in, in Spain. Um, her mm, view of Islam, uh, is very much or, or very similar uh, or informed <laughs> by some of the main uh, Islamic feminist authors such as Asma Barras, who um, in her book Believing Women in Islam says um, or claims that gender inequality does not come from Quran, but from the tafsir and the ahadith and other secondary and, and third and fourth uh, degree sources uh, of Islam. So what she says is we need a feminist hermeneutics, a feminist interpretation of the Islamic sources. Um, this is very much what Anna was claiming, right? Um, Anna, um, Anna's quote um, at a certain point in the interview is the egalitarian justice of Islam, which is quite similar to the uh, proposal of Amina Wadud herself, a new Muslim woman, Afro-American 
uh, woman who uh, coined the term gender jihad, whereby um, each of uh, us or each of uh, the people integrating the Muslim community as a deputy of Allah in er on earth should fight to implement the justice uh, inherent in Islam. And so this is where um, that justice would necessarily mean gender justice, would necessarily mean fighting against injustice. And so it's a jihad for gender equality, right? So um, this is very much where Anna's um, uh, yeah, discourse uh, comes. And there is also another woman called Nora who said, the Prophet married a woman who was 25 years older than him. Uh, Khadija was 15 years older, but in the interview she said 25. Who was rich and he worked for her and went by her orders. This is an example that shows that patriarchy emerges from culture, not religion. Again, this is one of the basic tenets of Islamic feminism, right? That says it's not coming from the sources, but from culture and interpretation of the sources. And then we see that um, in the testimony, uh, in the la last testimony of Anas, we can see that there is also another front that Islamic feminists uh, fight. She says, what I dislike in certain kind of secular feminism is that it validates patriarchal readings. Why is the patriarchal reading right or is more real? Have you, and she is talking to these feminists whom she um, is against or like she, that, that she disagrees with. Have you studied theology? Have you learned Quran? Have you questioned those hegemonic interpretations and why women did not play a role in them in the medieval period? Can you ask them, meaning the Muslim women, what they think? The gender lenses are to be worn all the time. You cannot just leave the religious realm out of it. Or are we leaving the, that realm to the machos? Right. I'm coming to an end. I'm, I, I feel that my voice has been going on for a while. The last um, case uh, that I wanted to bring is um, concerns Elena, whom we've also heard at the beginning. Um, and her case is, mm, in a way, quite opposite to the Islamic feminist tenets that I have just shown that Anna and Nora embraced. Um, for Elena, um, the um, control of passions is fundamental in Islam. For her, passions <coughs> equal nafs or the ego and the shaitan. And um, what I will present very briefly now um, is what Saba Mahmoud, who uh, was um, a Pakistani American scholar, um, sort of um, argued in one of her books, uh, The Politics of Piety, um, is that uh, al haya or modesty or shyness is a pillar of the subjectivity of those women who um, work in order to embody the pious uh, subject as they understand uh, piety uh, to be in accordance with Islam. So um, the case of Elena, I think, um, represents this will to embody uh, the pious Muslim woman. And I want to argue that this is in a way, very different to the Islamic feminists that I have been talking about, but in a way, it's, sorry to repeat again, but it's a way that Elena finds in order to fight inequalities in um, heterosexual relationships. 
let me go into the story and try to make it clearer. So Elena and Ahmed, if you remember, uh, this was her partner, uh, started a relationship and then Elena converted to Islam, embraced Islam, and uh, they introduced some changes in the relationship in order to make it more pious and more, in, in, in their view, more in accordance with the kind of Islam that they wanted uh, to represent. Um, for example, at the beginning of the relationship, they would have uh, sexual relationships, and then they stopped having uh, intercourse, and they lived together, but they, they also shared their apartment with another person. Elena started wearing a khimar, that she, and she wouldn't show him her hair. They, what they wanted is to purify purify their, their relationship and to have a different foundation. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see what I think is also an explanation and, um, well, insights that uh, can help us understand a little bit better what all of this is about. She says, I am very jealous, very, very jealous. And the first person I haven't felt jealous about is him, Ahmed, because I know he is respectful toward God in the first place, second, toward himself. He is shy to look at a woman. Shyness is, a very, is very important to Muslims, to be able to have control over everything we do, the passions, and take responsibility of the consequences. And then she talks about her previous relationship. I have no doubt about the fact that Pedro, her ex, loved me much, but it's a weird way of loving. He loved me and others at the same time. He wouldn't have got back home on a Sunday by 11 a.m and I had been calling him since 6 a.m. and he wouldn't answer the phone. I would get so, so mad. Well, these are brief <laughs> versions of very long interviews. What I am trying to argue is that for Elena, in this previous relationship, um, there was a, a clear inequality, and this is um, sort of the, the kind of uh, gender inequalities that in the secular paradigm um, take place. Whereas uh, with Ahmed, she is able to establish new rules, a new pious um, pact or contract that makes the relationship and their positions uh, be um, more equal, at least in some realms. Okay, so what I have tried to do in um, my presentation today, tonight is to show that there are myriad, a lot of um, interlinked elements uh, which have attracted Spanish women to Islam, uh, women who were not born uh, in Islam and who decided to embrace Islam. I have argued that there is um, a lot of agency, not only in their choice to become Muslims, but also in the way they navigate Islamophobia and sexism and all the other um, things, right? Uh, the, the, the need of a community, a lot of other elements that um, I have uh, pointed at. Um, I have also shown that they face a lot of Islamophobia and also sexism and sometimes both um, from both the Muslim and the non-Muslim community that Islamic feminism but also um, the notion of piety um, is uh, used by them or embraced in order to fight inequality and to practice a more equal way of being in the world. Thank you very much.
para Carla Ofico. We have time for questions. Any questions from the side? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for the very informative uh, talk and presentation. Uh, I was wondering what is your own idea? Is Islam uh, uh, ha having an unequal uh, look at men and women or not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> very big question. Well, Personally, I think there is, um, there is no such thing as Islam in singular. It depends on the historical time, on the, on the geographical side, where local cultures also inform ways of understanding and also of practicing um, Islam. And I also think that um, the interpretations, uh, so mine as well, are, are very much informed by our own um, experiences. So this is a little bit what I have been trying to argue as well, that each of these women have a, tra a personal trajectory and then uh, are in contact with structural and historical elements such as Islamophobia, such as sexism, uh, that also shape their own understanding of Islam. So I think, so my answer is... What do you think? What I, do you think? I, th I think there is n n no one answer. There is, I think there are a lot of views of, of uh, Your of Islam. point of view, I know. I know there are people that are different and Anyway, I believe you have some experience of the society and of the people, of, of the different Muslims, different countries. So yeah. I want to know, what is your idea? Um, for me, Islamic feminism is, um, is the most interesting of the approaches in the sense that okay. it, uh, it tries to really yeah, apply a feminist methodology of reading uh, the texts <laughs> and understanding uh, Islam. So, you know, feminism has been deconstructed in science, for example, as well, uh, all the reans, right? History, I'm a historian, so if we look at history, uh, many of the books are written by men, talk about men, not, not so much in the Islamic okay. tradition where, where women so are very mean, much present. But you mean that uh, Islam needs feminists to become uh, a new religion? Or no, like no. any other religions, of, uh, I believe uh, Judaism uh, and Christianity have the same culture, and this is a culture. It is. <laughs> and of course, now the culture of the world is changing, right? And another point that I was going to mention, as you said, there are not just one Islam, or there are not one kind of Muslims. Each of us, as we have different shapes, different bodies, different brain, so we have different uh, comprehension of Islam. So we are, we can call each other like Shia, Sunni, this and that but we are different in any how. And the point is that we have to accept each other and we have to believe there is one God and there is justice to point out, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is my view, actually. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I'm sure you have uh, come across the work of uh, Fatima Nassim. Yeah, of course. Of course, she deals with many of these issues, being a scholar of Islamic theology and history. Um, although I have disagreed with her on many occasions, mm -hmm. but still, it's interesting. 
What uh, surprises me is the virulent opposition of Western feminism or Islamophobia in Western feminism vis a vis their sisters, mm -hmm. whom they should be able to identify with. This is quite puzzling. Any, any views mm. on that? Well, actually, this is uh, one of the starting points of my inquiry. I was so disturbed at mm, the part, because it wouldn't be also um, fair to say that all Western feminism is Islamophobic. There have been also throughout history a lot of initiatives that really prioritize that sisterhood that you were mentioning. And, uh, and now with the decolonial um, methodologies also, it's, it's really about trying to um, deconstruct that neo-colonial approach to uh, Muslim women. So, the, but truly there is a part of, of, uh, of Western feminism that we cannot deny it is, is very Islamophobic and personally this was one of the um, motivations um, to start this research and as I was saying the introduction of my MA research had this illustration um, well you cannot see but the illustration that I that I talked about right of this uh, union that prioritizes solidarity between women and uh, I hope that is the, the direction that we follow. I think uh, probably Muslim feminists are taking uh, independent path. So you must be familiar obviously with uh, Ziba Mir Hussaini mm -hmm. who is at SOAS as well. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Persian at all. With? Persian language? No, no. unfortunately. Because after the revolution, there have been a number of magazines like Zana Ruz and so on, yeah. very delicately examining these issues. Absolutely. But coming more and more to the conclusion that they have to move beyond hermeneutics Mm -hmm. Because hermeneutics also locks them in Absolutely. to a narrative which does yeah. not provide a complete solution. Yeah. So Asma tries that, but others are also. Mm -hmm. so I think probably that's the way they are going to go and say to the Western feminists, <coughs> it's up to you mm -hmm. whether mm -hmm. you want to join or not. Yes, but at the, can I make two comments on your very informative uh, comment? So, uh, precisely in, um, in Iran, um, there, there is this one journal called Zana, that Zana means... Ruth. Huh? Zana Ruth. Yes. Women of today. Women. Yeah, exactly. Where, uh, all, uh, well, uh, where a lot of the um, starting points uh, and tenets of Islamic feminism uh, develop, but... It is also true that um, several scholars have been lately pointing out that uh, in these journals, both Islamic feminists and secular feminists were having conversations and that we shouldn't actually separate so much and speak of them as two <coughs> clearly differentiated groups because they were also building knowledge together and... and you know, and, and discussing amongst each other. And, um, and then, yes, going beyond hermeneutics is very much the approach that um, um, Amina Wadud takes with her gender jihad saying, because hermeneutics locks us, uh, then let's um, take the principle of justice that is so important in Qur'an as what leads us to our fight against uh, gender inequality in our everyday life beyond mm, certain ahadith or um, specific ayat, etc., etc. So yes, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Isaiah. That was a good presentation. It's, it's taught us a bit more about the history of Spain as well, because 
If I remember rightly, women have always, uh, through the ages, have played a slightly forward role in politics as well over there. Um, what I'd like to touch on is that when you say these women have now embraced Islam, is there a larger group? Yeah, when your study was concentrated on few people, are they getting together? Are they sort of holding seminaries, for example, studying together, holidaying together, and making a force of themselves? So are they visible or are they still underground as such? Because I can imagine the opposition that they would be getting now. So is that a unified force or not? So yes and no. Um, I, I interviewed only five women and uh, most of them were from um, my region, the Basque region in the north of Spain, but not, not all of them. Um, Anna, for example, the uh, Islamic feminist activist, um, has been very active um, uh, in organizing a series of events uh, related to Islamic feminism uh, since the 2000s. So I believe that uh, since the, um, like, uh, in the 2000s, there was a high moment in which these feminists were coming together and especially um, in joint effort with uh, new Muslims in the region of Catalonia, uh, where they did have an association. Uh, but now it's, kind of, so they were very vocal. Um, and uh, now I think it's kind of died out a little bit. There are associations here and there, but they are not, I would say, so vocal and so well known. However, historically, there is a very important group um, in the south of Spain, in the region uh, that we call Andalusia, and that is where Al Andalus um, stayed uh, the longest, um, where there was a, a community of new Muslims that came out only when the dictator uh, died and the new democratic uh, era started in the late 70s in Spain. And uh, it is interesting to see what they were writing because this was in the 80s and so they were revisiting Spanish history and saying, well, actually, uh, our ancestors were Muslims and so they were revisiting the history of um, not only Al-Andalus as a historical um, epoch, or, and, and which we could approach from different uh, uh, points of view, but specifically uh, revisiting the Andalusi authors uh, and what they were saying about Islam, about, for example, female um, imamates. Uh, and so it was interesting that they were sort of developing their own <coughs> Islamic genealogy based on Spanish history. Great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank Any impact on the, on the Moriscos in uh, South America? Any? Impact on the Moriscos? Yeah, so the, this is what they were claiming, sort of the, the whole history of uh, the presence, the contributions, and then the expulsion as well, yeah. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the Spanish context, if you could talk about that. So the current political situation, how that sort of impacts on these women. I don't know when you did your research, mm. was it, if it was recent or not. Uh, it or was, it's, a while ago. it's from 2012. Okay, so, so whether, whether you, you know, what, what your thoughts are basically how that impacts on these women or on sort of converts or, mm -hmm. um, or the community. And then also I was wondering, because you mentioned about the, de <laughs> you know, the decolonial feminist movement, like, mm -hmm. ha is that linked to the Islamic feminist movement in Spain? Like, do they actually talk to each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, the current um, context, I guess you mean of uh, the rise of the extreme right and fascism. Um, we weren't quite there in 2012, and unfortunately now it seems like it's come to stay and, and I was saying before 
until a year and a half there was no extreme right party in <coughs> Spain and suddenly we have 40, uh, 52 seats in Parliament and uh, they precisely also frame their own racist and Islamophobic discourses within the history um, of Spain and of Reconquista and they make very ahistorical claims regarding the presence of uh, Islam and Muslims in Spain, as you can imagine. So we, it wasn't as tragic and unfortunately, because I, I did my research in 2012 and then moved to history and, and other um, adventures, I, I'm not so sure, but I suspect that the situation is only worse for them, especially for the women who uh, show, whose bodies show that they are Muslim. So I can suspect that, um, that the kind of Islamophobic uh, attacks that um, Hassan was receiving from her neighbors have only gotten worse, more numerous and more, more violent. Um, Yes, so I think that is the, what I can say about the, the current uh, context. And um, with regard to the decolonial uh, movement, yes, there are links between um, Islamic feminists, uh, m Muslim women who, who wouldn't mm, define themselves as feminists but who are organized and who also speak and are vocal as Muslim women and um, and the colonial feminists. Yes, there are links, there are, yeah. And it is, uh, alhamdulillah, considered necessary that Islamophobia uh, is taken seriously uh, as part of the decolonial um, project. Yeah, thank you. Small question. Um, how much in your research did you pay attention to the urban women compared to the rural women in rural areas? Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. So, yeah, as I said, this was a, um, a research that I conducted in, in 2012, and it became a very mm, la long uh, piece of work uh, because I also, as I said, uh, I attended the meetings for new Muslims that uh, they would do in a mosque in Bilbao in the Basque Country. But uh, in terms of the interviews, I only conducted five of them. They were in-depth uh, live story interviews, but they were with five women. And of them, the majority lived in urban areas. Yes, and the mosque that, uh, um, of which I attended the meetings uh, was also set in Bilbao, which is a, a large urban area. However, <coughs> some of the people who would uh, come to the meetings, which were, again, like only for new Muslims, so not uh, Muslim uh, Basque people or Muslim immigrants living in the Basque country, but new Muslims, some would come from, from the villages uh, surrounding Bilbao. So, yeah, I guess the, the center is in the, in the city, but there are also people coming from the rural areas to the, to the mosques, because in the rural areas Thank you. there are none. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your question. But that is very interesting. I think, yeah, rural urban is a very meaningful um, Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll end there, if that's okay. Uh, if there are other questions that people have, um, so you, you'll be there for, for a few minutes yeah, afterwards. So uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, thank you very much. Salawat. Thank you.